Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'm Dr. Tess. Do you want to experience real joy? Thank you for being with us. To our dear president and Mrs. Gayova, AUP administrators, faculty and staff, students, guests, welcome to our civil celebration of Thanksgiving. May I ask you again, what do you think would be a great way to experience real joy? You're right, Thanksgiving. But most often than not, we easily overlook this kind of grateful attitude. Maybe because it is just like a trail covered of materialism, our desire to succeed, or even the lack of awareness. When we acknowledge God's gifts and all those great things that He did for us, we can have an end of feel of what we really have to say and to thank God for. So it is but most fitting for us to declare the promise in Psalm chapter 9 verse 1 that says, I will declare of your great deeds, Lord. I will give you thanks forever. For today's event, we will be presenting to you a series of video clips, testimonies, thanksgiving, songs from our graduate students. Then, Pastor Ishmael Tabasan will handle our Sabbath school lesson about the church and education. I remembered one author who said that education, the Bible, is the foundation for education and personal development. We will discover that later on. Now, on behalf of the College of Education, I thank you and welcome you all to this great celebration. God bless. I invite everyone to pause for a moment for a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for convening us today for a common purpose, to praise and worship you on this Holy Sabbath day. We invite your Holy Spirit to be with us as we hold this virtual Thanksgiving worship. May you remind us of your faithful provision, even amidst the crisis that we continue to face. We dedicate our hearts to you, O Lord. Thank you for your mercy and your forgiveness. We ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.
old humble earthly homes where heaven is our light our fortresses of Happy Sabbath day to all of us. Our mission story this Sabbath comes from a small village in India. It is a story about a witch doctor named Bagicha who spent his life worshipping trees and idols. He believed in the power of his gods and credited them for making him wealthy. Many people came to his house to be healed and they gave him a lot of money. He was very rich but he lacked peace of mind. One day, Bagicha fell ill. He suddenly vomited, felt dizzy, and had a terrible headache. He tried to heal himself, but the spells that seemed to cure others did not help him. People came to be healed by, by him, but he refused them because he was also sick. One day, his son called a global mission pioneer who led a Seventh-day Adventist church in a neighboring village and asked him to pray for his father. The global mission pioneer Samson Sonny 
went to Bagita's home, but the witch doctor refused to speak with him. He did not want to talk to Samson Sony because he believed that his witchcraft is more powerful. But Samson Sony did not want to leave the house without a prayer. So he prayed before he left. After the visit, Bagita's health got worsened and he was taken to the hospital in Jalandar. It is a city of about 1 million located about 90 minutes away by car from Bagita's house. A physician ran test and announced that Bagita had a brain tumor. You will die soon if we don't if we don't operate you, the physician said, but sadly Bagicha could not directly uh, get the decision to be operated because the operation was very expensive. Bagicha had earned great wealth at witchcraft. He had earned a lot of money, but he had lost it seeking a cure for his ill. Now, he and his family only had half the money needed for the operation. Samson Sony heard that Bagicha was in the hospital and Bagicha was struggling with the, with the operation fee. So he came and faced it. Bagicha was feeling sad. But when Bagicha saw Samson Sony came to the hospital, he directly stood up and approached the physician. Here comes Jesus who can heal me without the operation. Then Samson asked the physician for permission to pray and he prayed. Dear God, in the name of Jesus, please heal Mr. Bagicha to glorify your name. In Jesus' name, Amen. That's the prayer. It was very short. But the next day after the prayer, the physician ran a check and to his surprise, he couldn't find no trace of the tumor. He was not sure with the result, so he called another specialist for a, sec for a second opinion. And the specialist, specialist could not find the tumor. It was the same. After that, Bagicha declared, I used to be heavily involved in witchcraft, but the global mission pioneer prayed and revealed Jesus to me, he said. Now, I believe in Jesus, I believe that Jesus has healed me, and I am free from tumor. Jesus came to me through the global mission pioneer. He went to find Samson and say that Jesus has healed him. Then he went to his family. He was not satisfied. Then he went to his neighbor and tell them about Jesus. I have been healed and I have been freed from my witchcraft, he said. You also must come to the church where Jesus heals. Because of Bagicha's testimony, many people started coming to the church every Sabbath. And about 50 people took Bible studies from Samson and half of them were baptized in September 2018, including Bagicha and three members of his family. The others were continuing to take Bible studies and others were joining them. Today, Bagicha is a faithful member of the church. Bagicha and, and his family members and friends were baptized by Samson. And part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help them to construct a larger church for them to worship God and glorify God. This is the mission story this Sabbath. Thank you.
Happy, happy Sabbath to everyone. I'm so thankful for the invitation. I count it as a special privilege to be with you this morning and also to serve you in the review of our lesson this week. Last week we have tackled about Jesus as our master teacher and the lessons we can get from him, from his teaching ministry. We are so, to, we are so thankful to God because this whole quarter, our minds is being brought into the focus how we value Christian education and how we make the Bible central in our teaching ministry. Jesus as our master teacher. Jesus being a teacher was described by Mark in chapter 1 verse 22. People were amazed at his teaching, in his teaching because he taught with authority, not like the scribes. People were astonished. People were marveled, were amazed how Jesus taught. He taught with authority, not like the scribes. What makes Jesus more authoritative? Teacher than the scribes is Jesus live what he taught. The lesson for this week is about church and education. How church to the teaching ministry. But before we discuss that, let me define the word church. According to my readings, the church was taken from two main words in Greek. Number one is Koryakos. Koryakos means that which belong to the Lord. So church are group of people who belongs to the Lord. So you are you and I are members of the church. And being member of the church, we are also have that privilege to teach. But before we continue on, shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our gracious Father in heaven, this morning, we come to you. We thank you, Father, for you are our God. We thank you for sending your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who left us a good example how to teach, how to live a life that is pleasing unto your sight. Lord, may the lesson that we will uh, be reviewing will help us equip not only knowledge but also an experiential knowledge that you are God who is at work in our lives. For we ask this in the loving name of Jesus. Amen. Church and education. Let me read to you the Key text. First Thessalonians 2, 6 to 8. It says here, Paul as a teacher, Paul who considered himself as a teacher, have these characteristics. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, just as nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you 
We were well placed, well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. Let's uh, look at this passage. Uh, teachers are not men pleasers, but they are men who give glory to God. Teachers are gentle, like a nursing mother who cherishes her own children. Let us consider every individual as close to us, someone who is valuable, like a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you, not only to impart the gospel, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. So a true teacher does not only impart knowledge, not only teach the truth, but also giving all the time, the sacrifice, the talent, resources, just to make a teaching a reality, to make teaching effective for every student. There are characteristics of a teacher. Number one, a teacher must see individual as Jesus does. Luke 10.33 says here, But a certain Samaritan as he journeyed came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. You know, the Gospel writers describes Jesus, man who was full of compassion. St. Paul Matthew 9.36 We have also Luke 7.13 Mark 1.14 When he saw the crowd, he was moved in compassion because they are like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus looked at individuals even to their needs. So Jesus related the parable of the Good Samaritan. The priest passed as if he doesn't uh, notice one individual who is in need of compassion. The Levites in the same manner passed by as if he doesn't see the one who is in need. But the Samaritan took care brought that wounded man willing to give the resources, willing to spend, willing to show compassion even to his very own enemy. The lesson is telling us that we should put value on the individual. So as a church, if we want to make teaching effective, our education successful, is to look to every member of the church, to every individual whom we come in contact as precious in the sight of God. It says here, however, just knowing those truths is not enough to treat others kindly and without any prejudice. Seeing as Jesus does involve fixing our eyes on the cross and not on ourselves. This perspective will help us to see the value that God sees in every individual and in every human being. The second characteristic that church should have is this living as Jesus us, living as Jesus taught us to do. In Matthew 5:16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. This passage of Matthew chapter 5, you will know that this is uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. When he starts his preaching on the focus of those who are blessed. Blessed those who are mourned, for they will be comforted. Blessed those who are hunger, because they will be satisfied. Blessed are those who are meek, for even he will inherit the land. Those who are merciful, for they will obtain mercy. Those hunger for righteousness, 
and those who have pure in heart that they will see God. You shall know that's a blessed and then followed by rejoice. Rejoice when you will be tortured, when you will be suffering for Him. Rejoice. Light that is set on a hill will give directions. So in the same manner, the way we live will give us directions. When people witness the way we live, that will give them guidance. That will give them time to ponder. It says here, let your light so shine, you poor men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The main purpose why God created or established the church, His church, is to give Him the glory. Doing His mission is part, very important part of doing the mission that God has called Him. Giving Him the glory is our main mission. If we teach, we are giving Him the glory. If we minister, if we live, if we do good works, we'll give Him the glory. It says here, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The Bible is very clear, this passage is very clear that it is only when people will give glory to God when they see in church member the good works. When you and I become light in the community. So the church, in order that teaching will become effective, will be powerful. When you preach the gospel, when the church preach the gospel, it becomes more powerful. The third characteristic characteristics should be caring as Jesus did. A new commandment that I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. If you read uh, the writings of John, the Gospel, the three epistles, and the book of Revelation, one of his uh, main theme is about love. Love one another, caring one another, caring as Jesus did. Jesus is our model in caring ministry. How he cared for people during his time. So John is saying a new commandment. He wrote the message coming from Jesus. A new commandment I give to you. That you love one another as I love you. That you also love one another. And uh, First John I says two verse six. I'm not writing new commandment, but the same commandment. Let me tell you that the commandment, the principle is love. Love is the principle of the ten commandments. So being a member of church, which Christ is the head, we should have also bear in this in our mind our ministry. We are created, we were established as a church to provide care for the poor, helping the heartbroken, healing the sick, and liberating the captives from sin. You know, I'm so happy now that there is transition of the terminology being used now in the small groups. Before, we call their action team. We call this action team, then uh, we small we call it small group but now care groups so they are asking now how many care groups now in your church how many care group now you have in northern Luzon mission in central Luzon conference care group in order to make teaching effective we must be caring church one uh, saying goes like this, 
I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. We are good in preaching the gospel. We are good in teaching the truth. But are we caring enough? Do we care for people? Can they see a caring uh, ministry in our churches? A, care, a church that cares. I want to share to you my observation and my experience when I was in Northern Luzon Mission yet, serving as the executive secretary, I visited one of the churches in Isabela. Then, uh, nagbukal, barangay nagbukal San Isidro. I met in that place the couple who were uh, attending already in the church about three months. One uh, sister introduced them to me that pastor they have been attending our church service for services for almost three months three months and they don't uh, absent themselves every sabbath and even midweek and vesper i was so happy so and then more interested to talk with this couple and ask some questions and I was so amazed with their uh, reply, with the responses to my questions as as, what makes you continue attend our church services? You know, the response is, Pastor, we felt God's presence. We want to respond the love of God to us, but we will also say that we feel we are belong, we belong to this group. The group members care for us, they prayed for us, they minister to us. Let me tell you that uh, couple, uh, that family with their children, after three months when I met them, of course, that already six months they are attending in the church. I have, was given the privilege to baptize this husband and wife with their children. A caring group is really doing their task or their mission. Evangelism or witnessing is more successful. So that's the reason why the central focus of our teaching is the Bible. Whether we teach mathematics, science, psychology, they should fall in line what the Bible teaches, the Bible perspective or Bible worldview. So education, real education is not only theoretical knowledge. It should be an experiential knowledge. He should not on that as not aim that they should only understand it, but to live through it. That is experiential knowledge, because no one can contradict, can argue with your experience. I know that God is faithful because I've experienced it. Preaching about love, but did we really apply love in our midst? That is really a goal of our education, seeking the truth that we see in Jesus. The Bible should be lived up. Christian education involves leading people to the truth by looking for answers in the Bible, the book that contains the truth that Jesus shared. Sharing Jesus, for where there are two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. You know, the book of Acts tells us how the early Christians loved to share Jesus. How they loved to preach the gospel. 
the good news to others. You know, if you read the book of Acts, Luke recorded that the early believers were excited to share about Jesus, to share who Jesus is to their neighbors, to their loved ones, to their relatives. Christians should share their faith, grew together in the truth, and put the gospel into practice in those groups. Those were open groups and they were eager to share the truth with whomever was willing to accept it. So, sharing Jesus. The church must have this passion. The church should have this burden. And it is their joy to share Jesus to others. Because when we share Jesus to others, people's life become different. I would like to re-emphasize that the church was created for mission. The church was organized to teach. And in order that the church will be powerful enough to teach and more effective in the teaching ministry, we should see individual as God looks at them. Second, we should be the light of the world. We should live the way Jesus wants us to live. The third one, caring should be the characteristic of everyone. Let's care for one another and love to share the truth that we embrace. Love to share. We love to share the joy we experience in Jesus to others. We love to share the truths we found, the truths that set us free. That is the mission of the church. We are doing all this because we want to give God the glory. Again, church and education. I would like to repeat the African proverb. It took the whole community to teach a child. It took the whole members. It takes the whole members of the church to educate a child. It takes the whole church to be involved in witnessing, in teaching the gospel, preaching the gospel to all people. May God bless us this morning.
let us pray our gracious and heavenly father all praises glory be unto you alone O God we thank you for the Sabbath day that you have created you have made and designated it as a holy day indeed O God we are so blessed to be reminded of the Christian ministry the church ministry and the Christian education that we must have obtained thank you O God for this wonderful opportunity to gather in the midst of this pandemic you have been so good to all of us you have given us chance to reflect on your goodness to always look into your beauty and into your holiness especially this designated day of the Sabbath indeed you have spared us from the business of this life oh God th thank you for the Sabbath school that we have participated and enjoy may the continuous blessings of the Holy Spirit be unto us forever and ever in Christ's name I pray amen
Happy Sabbath everyone! It's really good to be with you all in this uh, very special Sabbath day where we could celebrate God's goodness and God's love for each one of us. So um, for our call to worship, I would like to read a passage or a quotation from Ellen G. White that could be found in her book uh, Education, page 84, um, paragraph 1. This is what it says. The most complete illustration of Christ's methods as a teacher is found in his training of the twelve first disciples. Upon this man were to rest weighty responsibilities. He had chosen them as men whom he could imbue with the Spirit and who could be fitted to carry forward his work on earth when he should leave it. To them, above all others, uh, he gave uh, the advantage of his own companionship, uh, companionship rather. Through personal association, he impressed himself upon these uh, chosen collaborators. Uh, the life was manifested, says John the Beloved, and we have seen it and bear witness. Uh, may we tune our hearts and our minds for this very special day, for this is a sign of God's love for each one of us. Uh, and may we... Um, uh, may we always remember that we are God's collaborators in His ministry to make discipleship uh, for our fellow men.
For our scripture reading today, please open your printed or digital Bible and join with me as I read Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 to 22. I will be using the King James Version. It says, Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandments to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this beautiful blessed Sabbath. We are so blessed that despite of the pandemic, we are still able to praise you and worship you together through online service. Please may you be with all the participants and guide them according to your will so that people who are watching online may be blessed and inspired by your words, songs, and memory verses. And thank you so much for your unconditional love. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stop. 